Hello everybody and welcome this week to Talking Flutes Extra with me, Jean-Paul Wright. A big shout out must go to our podcast sponsors, TJ Flutes, who have been with us since we started this pod journey 257 episodes and over five years ago. You can show them some flute love by visiting them on their socials at TJ Flutes on Instagram, Trevor James Flutes on Facebook and on the web at tjflutes.com. After completing degrees from New York University and the Aaron Copeland School of Music, Morgan Papas has gone on to work with many internationally acclaimed artists, ensembles and brands. Morgan was the former director of operations for the Rodney Marsalis Philadelphia Big Brass, director of the Galway Flute Festival, led by Sir James and Lady Galway, and a former sales manager and resident flutist at the Flute Centre of New York. She is currently a co-editor for the viral online flute magazine, The Flute View. Morgan's forward-thinking outlook continues to inspire her to cultivate a depth of knowledge and insight that continues to evolve to this day. Whilst managing a roster of dynamic musicians, Morgan implements her unique consulting skills to inspire clients to step up and claim their success in the various realms of the music industry. She has also recently released a brilliant new ebook, How to Be Your Own Agent, a holistic approach to defining your artistic identity, defining a brand, and promoting your vision. Let's welcome our very special guest this week, Morgan Papas. Now, I first met Morgan quite a few years ago now in New York when she was working with the Flute Center of New York. Now, Morgan is a beautiful flute player, although she has gone a different direction nowadays, and we'll speak about that in a minute. So, from the wonderful, wonderful jungle of Costa Rica, looking at me with a ceiling fan going around in circles, and Morgan has already pre-warned me that a monkey may pull out the leads, because it happened last <laughs> week. I'd like to say a huge welcome. Welcome to Morgan. Hi, Morgan. Hi, John Paul. Thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, it's my pleasure. Now, tell me, New York, Costa Rica, or Costa Rica, as you <laughs> Americans would call it, what's well, big difference? I know you go back to New York on a regular basis, but why such a different place to live in? Is this a creative vibe? Is it, is it somewhere you go just to be completely free? What's made you make that quantum leap over? Sure. Well, you know, I spent most of my life in New York. I was born and raised there. I did all my degrees there. My beginning of my professional career was in New York as well, working at Flute Center of New York and a few other um, professional entities. But I discovered Costa Rica during COVID. I needed to like get out. Um, this was like pre-vaccine actually. So it was two winters ago. I was kind of having a really rough winter and everything was still kind of shut down in New York. And Costa Rica was, was one of the few places you could travel to easily. And I decided to just go for it. And I came out here for a month and I loved it. And I've been coming back every winter since then. Um, and I made a switch to be like fully remote with my work as of last May. So I was able to be out here for most of the winter. Um, and yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a creative place for me. I feel like I have some really interesting new energy to work with here. I wake up very early with the sunrise and the sounds of the animals and I'm meeting tons of people in totally different industries that just give me ideas and concepts for um, my music business practices. So it's it's just really great. And I find that I can focus quite well here and just having a healthy lifestyle, being very active and moving a lot. And and I love New York. I love all the cultural, you know, offerings that it has and the buzz of it. But I will say I, I don't love the winters there. <laughs> so anything, anything to get out for a bit is, you know, definitely a plus so I'm very happy and grateful to be here in sunny Costa Rica. <laughs> now anyone who follows you Morgan Pappas on Instagram or Facebook will know that you actually look really serene you're such a you lead a life that is sort of 
you have it's very holistic life you're very into um you're very careful what you eat you're into yoga you're into meditation yeah. you're into the whole well-being process but the morgan papas that people know you're not just this lovely flute player you are driven in many many areas and you have you're instrumental in sort of carving a very different career that a lot of people that aspire to be professional musicians and who perhaps are listening to this podcast who had dream of being a world-class professional player who then find that the opportunities aren't necessarily there or if they are there they don't know how to open them up you've sort of carved this very unusual channel out as a, an agent a managing agent but also managing your career when did you first sort of veer off from being solely a flute player so when I was in school for my master's program, that's sort of when Instagram became a thing and people were using it regularly um, to share a bit of their identity. It was very much a personal platform, but it started to gravitate towards more of, you know, sharing your music once it became a video sharing platform. Originally, it was just photos. And around that time is when I really started to connect with a lot of musicians including you. Yeah. I mean, I think I might have even connected with you before I started working at Flute Center of New York. Yes, you did, yeah. Yeah, because I was very active. I was sharing a lot about my practice journey in school, but also I had a chamber group that I was actively promoting on Instagram. And I met so many people in the industry, other flutists in Europe, other flutists in the States. It's a big reason why I got a job at Flute Center of New York, which has opened up so many doors for me, just because there, there were so many professionals coming in and out. I was learning a lot about how professional musicians play, just listening to them play test so many flutes and seeing how they choose, you know, their instrument and everyone's so different, you know, and it actually gave me a lot of confidence in my performance career because I realized there's not a singular approach to being a professional. And just having the opportunity to meet so many people, I naturally began to do some consulting with social media. And then I met the Galways at Flute Center of New York, which opened up a lot of doors for me because I started to do some work for them. I met some people, you know, like you and other companies and brands and even personal clients who became mentors of mine, you know, that have business backgrounds and just enjoy playing the flute. Um, as a hobby, they they often gave me a lot of opportunities just because they saw my work process through purchasing a flute. So how did I get here? <laughs> That's a good question. So it started really with social media because I was doing social media management for uh, very prominent musicians. And then that naturally and organically became like direct management, helping musicians get some opportunities in New York performing and even in Mexico and in Europe. Then that became some production for festivals and it's just kind of naturally been developing and along the way I stopped being a professional musician myself and it was definitely an active choice. I realized that I personally prefer to be on the like back end of the creativity. I'm, you know, a very organized person and I tend to compartmentalize my work and being a professional flutist and being around so many professional musicians, I kind of realized, you know, that's not really who I am or how I want to live my life. And that's okay. I'm still using all the skills from school. You know, I know what it takes to be a professional and I know the mindset. And I also know like what was not taught in school and what a lot of these musicians are struggling with in their careers and need assistance or need guidance or need some outside assistance to get their careers to the level that they want to be at and to do the projects they want to do. That's all to say that now I'm in an agent role. I started a small agency with one of my bigger clients. Uh, they're actually a brass band. There's no flutes and I'm involved <laughs> in that. But we decided to create a small agency seeing a need for some fillings in performing art centers in the states and yeah it's been really fun and navigating that world has been really interesting for me and I've, I find it incredibly beneficial on, in so many ways and that's when I created this ebook last month to help others who don't have an agent or don't have representation because they can totally do it on their own you don't need to be part of an agency or on a roster to be booking your own engagements understanding the the roots of what you are and the root of who you are as a baseline and you start that really well in your book it's defining your artistic identity 
Now that is a really interesting question because how many of us actually define ourselves? I mean, do we? How many of us know who we actually are as individuals, let alone musicians? So, how would you go about? I know you you list it here, and there's lots of uh, areas that you actually write in within this book. But without sort of giving the, all the game away, how would you def- get somebody to define their artistic identity and also their artistic intent, really, I suppose? Yeah, I think this is why I put this in the beginning of the ebook is because, like myself included, um, when we go into music school, we really don't know what our long term goal is. You know, it's sort of like we know we want to be a musician, we know we want to be on a stage, we know we want to perform, but why like why do we want to do this you know is it for the high that we get is it because we genuinely love to see people smiling in the audience i think the why is so so important i did an interview a few weeks ago and i I briefly touched upon this but i think it's really crucial you know i when i go to concerts i always read the program notes and the bios of the performer and i think it's really fascinating to see what people decide to put in their bio And sometimes it can just be a list of awards, you know? Like, I grew up here, I did this, I went to this school, I studied with these teachers, these are my awards. And to me, that's really not very interesting. Like, I wanna know in your bio, like, why? Why did you decide to go to music school? Why did you decide to study with that teacher? Why are you on the stage right now to share your music with me? I think, especially now coming out of COVID and coming out of we're still in a great time of uncertainty, it's really important to connect with your audience on a deeper level. It's not enough to just get on a stage and perform a memorized piece that you practice for hours in a practice room. You really need to understand like why you're on the stage to share the craft that you've been practicing. And having that why is going to really fuel your career and it's really going to take you to a level where you have so much certainty in what you do that you're not even questioning, you know, oh, I made a mistake on that note, or I did this, or I did that, because at the end of the day, your why is the most important thing. It's not so much about, um, you know, how perfect your playing was, but it's about how you made the audience feel, and how did that make you feel in return? That's really interesting. Sorry, Morgan, I didn't mean to interrupt, but that's really interesting, is that you're getting almost a rapport creation with the program notes before you come onto the stage. I mean, that is really, really interesting because normally we expect as performers to create the rapport, that process of walking onto the stage, that initial rapport creation, but you've taken it one stage further and say, no, get people on your team before you walk out. Yeah, I mean, that might be something that's specific to me, you know, because I'm in the business, I'm very curious what a musician's background is. You know, when you go to concerts and sometimes there's no bio or no program notes and that's fine too. But I have, I will say, I do have a bit of a bias when I read a program and I'm like, okay, like you're just listing yeah. a lot of awards. I'm sure you have great technique and it's gonna be, you know, fascinating to watch, but you really wanna feel a connection these days. And I mean, always, but now more than ever, like, and, having your why in mind when you get on stage like why am I here today playing music for this audience you know knowing that before you get on the stage is really going to transcend your performance and it's also going to transcend your career because you're going to be very clear on your intentions taking that one or two or three three or four stages further everything of what you write in this book is about that rapport creation whether it and we'll cover this in a second about whether it's brand creation whether it's uh, creating a program creating an educational uh, outreach it's all about creating that initial rapport which enables everything else to grow isn't it exactly and to do that you have to understand yourself yeah that's the hard bit (laughs) I did I did try to like sneak a little you know spirituality into this you know I do I have a strong meditation practice and over the last few years I've really grown into better understanding my authentic self and who I am and why I'm here in this lifetime and so I I snuck it in in a very holistic analytical way that I hope is approachable to musicians but I think in everything we do in life there should be intention Mm -hmm. and when there's intention people recognize that and they can connect more and they feel sincerity that comes from your artistry so yeah, I'm, I'm glad you 
noticed that thread throughout. <laughs> I did. And also the need to be grateful. Gratitude is so important in our business. We're musicians. We're there to portray a story as defined by a composer. And yeah, you've got the rapport creation with the audience. But we should also be grateful we have this gift because the audience in turn will be grateful for you conveying that story. So it's gratitude all around. And I don't think that we practice gratitude enough as musicians. No, absolutely. And, you know, one of the questions I put in the ebook was sort of what are like five pivotal career moments that you remember. And I was chatting with a girl recently who bought the ebook and she said she was surprised by what really like stuck out to her. And a lot of it was moments of teaching like moments where her students had these profound breakthroughs in their playing or clarity. And I think that's also part of, you know, being a musician and understanding your why. Is it to be, you know, of service to others to help them experience music through, you know, a tactile way? And that's just as beautiful as getting on a stage and in a concerto. It's just a different form of being a musician and a creative. So that's also, I'm hoping that part of this ebook, and maybe I'll expand on it, is really to better understand, you know, what trajectory you want your career to take, and then to make aligned action steps to make that a successful path for you in the long run, where you're not just following blindly, okay, I went to conservatory, now I need to take auditions to get into an orchestral chair, and then what? You have to know what you want at a very deep level, because there's not a singular path as a musician. And I do wish that the conservatories worldwide we're a little bit more open to different career paths and what being a professional musician can look like because there's so many options out there and there's something really beautiful about that. And you're absolutely right. Like having a gratitude practice will help you realize what you're most grateful for as being a creative and to focus on that because that's your essence as a musician. What I'm really chuffed about, and chuffed is a good old English word for being happy about, is chapter two, and it comes really high up in this book, which is designing your brand focus. Because this is one area that is critical to a musician, but yet a lot of people just sort of ignore it. And that's not only that's branding and marketing materials, but also how you're putting yourself out on the internet. And I'm so pleased that you put that as number two, because if that was further back, it would almost be, you've put it in order of importance, knowing who you are and then designing your brand because your brand is you, isn't it? Yes, exactly. And I think it's, again, going back to understanding who you really are and your why, but that branding will carry it with you throughout your whole career. And you can always change. You know, there's nothing wrong with changing. I know people who've done complete pivots mm -hmm. and that's totally cool and acceptable but I think just when you're working on a project or when you're designing a program that you want to perform or go on tour with like get very specific on the branding because that's going to help the audience and presenters and booking agents and talent buyers understand your message your creative message and I've coached in the past some individuals through this and I've worked with some companies on Instagram as well to help them with this and having a clear brand will make it easier for individuals to engage with you whether that's on social media or in real life on a stage if they understand what you're doing and understand your creative vision you're going to have more of an impact it's just as simple as that like anything in life I will say I'm not the best example. <laughs> My Instagram's all over the place. It's become a very personal account for me now, and that's just a move I made. It used to be very flute focused, and I did I do feel at some one point I had more of a flute identity, and you know it was specific to me. There was branding behind it, but you know now I've kind of moved into having a few different areas of life that I like to explore, and not just the flute, but there's lots of accounts out there that are doing a great job with branding and you see a post and you know immediately who it is you know you know their style of music you know their personality it's really about personality and you can have a lot of fun with this you know just get really clear on who you are and get comfortable with sharing that with the world and who you are is you the brand isn't it that's your thing exactly. it's making sure that you're the authentic you that what you're putting out in printed or program notes or on the internet is the authentic who you are rather than this sort of person that nobody knows about exactly 
And then that makes it easier to be your own manager once you know who your yeah. authentic self is. Yeah, because I, and this is kind of getting to the next chapter, but yeah. it's, all, it's all about sales. Like it's yeah. all about sales. You have to be able to sell your program, your vision, your creative process. So, you know, and that's where my background from Food Center of New York comes in. I, you know, was working in sales and I'm so grateful for that job because I learned so much you learn about human psychology, you know, the process of watching a flutist decide what $20,000 flute they're going to buy is really fascinating. <laughs> There's just so many little nuances to the instrument. And it's a beautiful journey. But I also learned, you know, many sales approaches. And that totally transferred over to my agent work 100%. Because when I'm talking to presenters or talent buyers or theaters, I don't want to use the word convincing because it's that kind of gives the implication that you know you're like selling something but it is a sale and I'm making sure that or I'm providing artists that will serve their programming needs and will serve the audiences provide entertainment but there's so much out there for presenters to choose from so you have to learn a sales approach and in order to do that you have to be very clear with your branding and have you know, like, this is who I am, this is my program, this is why it's going to be interesting to you and your audience, and this is why it's going to sell tickets. And if you're able to do that and get practice it over and over and over, which is what, you know, to go back to Rosaway, which is what Rachel and Steph were doing for years on their own, they figured out their branding, they figured out, you know, their sales pitch. And when they, they came to New York this past month at conferences with me, they were so good at pitching themselves. Like, you know, and I recognized that. I said, you know, this is what musicians need to learn in music school. And that's part of the reason why I wrote this ebook. It's you have to be able to know how to pitch yourself. It's not enough to just be a fantastic player. You have to let presenters know and say like, hey, like I have a program, a service that I think your audience is going to love and this is why. And if you're able to do that, you're going to have more success in getting on stages and getting paid engagements at the level and quality that you're hoping to receive. Well, there's many four-letter nasty words in our English language, isn't there? And But musicians, they tend to view the word sale or sales, as which is a five-letter word, as a dirty word as well. But it is key. Right. It's in key into creating your future, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think getting more comfortable with that fact and not and seeing the sale as an offering will might help. I, I personally I don't have any issue with the word sale. The, also the word transaction seems to be quite negative, but the reality is if you want a working living career as a musician and be able to have, you know, financial security, you're going to have to get comfortable with the term you know, sale or contract or recognize that you are selling a service and it's a creative service and it's going to provide a lot of happiness and beauty and great energy to an audience. But in order for that concert to take place, there's so many back end steps that need to occur that are quite transactional and that's okay. That's just how the business world works. The music business works that way. So the more comfortable you get with that and the more this is where it goes back to your why, knowing why you're so keen on being a professional musician and what you want to share with the world, you'll feel more comfortable and more solid and more grounded when you get to that stage where you are selling your show or selling your performance to a presenter. And when you're on stage or in a, yeah, doing a concert or in part of an orchestra, you're still selling yourself to the audience. You're selling what you Absolutely. can do. So we're inherently in this business sold up or enveloped in that four-letter word, sale. We are selling ourselves, our personality, our souls, really, aren't we? Because how we interpret something is a definition of ourselves. Absolutely. Now, promoting your vision. Now, I like that. But before uh, we sort of delve into that, how would you define the word vision in this context? performance you know a creative vision so the end result how you want someone to feel or how you want someone to experience what you're doing on stage is the vision so you know go back to the concept of meditating or visualizing literally visualizing what's happening when you're on stage performing and how the audience is interacting you know i'm in costa rica right now and i've been watching a lot of surf videos out here with friends because i'm going surfing quite often and trying to get better and there was an interview with Kelly Slater and you know I was thinking about how much 
this interview actually aligns with musicians' careers. It's a sim similar concept of practicing, practicing, practicing for that one moment, that one wave that's going to matter, you know, that's going to be judged or that's going to be listened to by the audience. And he talked about visualizing all the possible scenarios of this wave and how it's going to feel and how, you know, it's going to release him out of the barrel and all this. And I think it's really important for musicians to do the same, to visualize, you know, how it's going to feel on stage for them, you know, how that fermata or that moment in the chamber ensemble, that, you know, beautiful chord that they always like to feel in their body when they're rehearsing, like how that's going to feel during the performance. And that visualization really comes into play again with, you know, promoting because at the end you want everyone to feel what you're practicing right you, you want everyone to feel the experience that you're practicing in your room alone or on stage with your group you want that to translate to the audience and so when I say promoting your vision it's essentially that it's promoting that feeling that you've been working on to hone in on you know and then making sure that audiences have that ability to experience it the same way you have and the reason I hope I, that makes sense. It does. And the reason I <laughs> asked you that, Morgan, was because it's a very simple question to ask and a very potentially short statement to make. But this chapter in the book is so important because you've chunked it down into the vitally important route map. Basic things such as creating a database. How many musicians out there have created a database? And that's database of contacts, right. database of people who can assist you when you've got something new you want posting. You can just sort of, can you just like it and share it? Yeah, that, that database is so important, isn't it? Right. And I think we all network all the time. Musicians are always meeting new people at concerts, at festivals. You know, we go to F. Slutus, we go to NFA. But I think I, I included often forget like who I met and, you know, how we could help each other. And so as an agent, I started to use Salesforce to create a database of all my contacts so that I could help my my artists that I'm representing. And that could be as simple as, you know, someone who heard them play in an audience and said something positive and they know another theater somewhere else. But, you know, creating this database will really help you get organized and Back in the day, people used to use Rolodexes and hand out business cards. People are still handing out business cards, but now I think everyone's just gotten so used to social media, mm -hmm. but that's not enough. You need to really have everything organized and um, having a database will make it so much easier for you when you do have a project ready to promote or raise money for or CDs to sell or whatever it is, whatever, you know, you want to expand your flute studio for teaching. Um, having a database with all your contacts, you know, their title, where they're located, what they do, their email. I mean, that's just such a simple tool to use, but it's incredibly powerful. You successfully chunked everything down. This whole book is actually devoid of one thing, fluff. It's devoid <laughs> of anything that doesn't need to be there. And this is oh, what, I appreciate that. <laughs> and this is what I found as I've been scrolling on the train coming back from London to do the podcast with you, is that it's almost as though you've cut out. It's, it's, there is n there's very little emotion. It is you do this, you do this, and you've you're, you've captured everything into really succinct chunks, which is very unusual in how to do book nowadays. I appreciate that. You know, I wrote this book coming out of two big conferences in New York uh, that were all about presenting and booking your music. Chamber Music America Conference, which is designed for chamber groups, and APAP, Association of Performing Arts Professionals, they have these two massive conferences in New York. And I was just talking to so many other agents, to so many musicians looking for representation or looking to promote their act, their performance of all calibers and all backgrounds. You know, there were theaters that were booking, you know, $60,000 contracts. And then there were theaters that were looking for, you know, smaller chamber groups, you know, for a $2,000 contract. But it all came down to the very, like, core of everyone had to kind of, like, follow these same steps. And so luckily when I started to write this ebook, I was coming right out of those conferences with all this concepts and ideas and after listening and sitting in on a lot of meetings and you know I was like all musicians need to have this information and that's why I wrote the ebook and 
I did, you know, some editing, but I have to say it just came out very easily because I was coming off these intense weeks of meetings in the music industry. So ladies and gentlemen, you would imagine that this ebook was a book, a long book, but it's not. If I'd written it, it would be 100, 200, 300 pages, most of it fluff for most of it airy fairy dreams. What Morgan has put together is 30 pages of concise advice that if you read every single bit and follow the route that she's given you, will transform you, well, enable you to have a, your inner sat-nav working. Morgan has put together here is this sat-nav where you plug where you want to go. You're honest with your own abilities and your own potential. It enables you to get to point B, point C, point D in the shortest possible route, but with the utter clarity. So these are 30 important pages that works for any musician out there. And I commend you for this, Morgan. Oh, well, thank you. And I really appreciate your positive feedback. You know, I think it's always a bit vulnerable putting something out in the world, as all of us musicians know. And I I was sort of on the fence of like, well, is this even useful? Is anyone going to find, you know, this helpful in any way? But it's been nice to hear that people feel, you know, that it resonates with them in some way, even if it's just a few bullets from the ebook that they take away. My hope is that it can be of service, you know, in some form. And I did want to keep it simple, concise and sweet and not overwhelming. I want it to be incredibly approachable and, you know, maybe there'll be a follow up. I don't know, but I'm grateful for your your kind words of enthusiasm. (laughs) And I love one of the last sentences, which is attributed to Morgan Pappas. So I, I can't pinch it, which is working hard is only a virtue if you are working towards something you value and what a beautiful beautiful line that is the word what you value values and working hard they they're aligned and it's understanding your values and it's understanding because your values will create joy and then your joy will transcend in how you present yourself to other people and how you present your brand doesn't it exactly and i wanted to bookend the book with that because i felt you know the why at the beginning and it's a process it's a lot of work being a professional musician it is it's not easy it's not an easy career but if you love what you're doing then the process is part of the enjoyment and part of the creative trajectory of who we are as individuals so yeah i like to have that as a bookend to the beginning of the why I could see a holistic book coming. I could see a holistic ebook, which would be for those that are are open to understanding where the inner, the inner self, how that aligns yeah. with the the self that is people see. Because you know, sometimes we wear we have to wear two hats, don't we? Two heads, and sometimes we like doing something. So I can prob- possibly see you sort of um, branching out in the future to do more of that sort of a holistic inside book understanding more of inside i would love that i mean it's something i work on personally every Mm. day and i think everyone should to some degree is to better understand themselves and their inner being and their inner authenticity i really believe we are so conditioned since childhood to be a certain way to act a certain way and this applies to music conservatory so much you know to play the polenk sonata a very specific way with a very specific nuance and the french tonguing method and you know I, I I understand the importance of that but we always have to return back to who we are and why we're doing what we're doing and it's it's a continuous lifelong practice of returning to ourselves deconditioning so yeah maybe a holistic book in the future I don't well, know I'll, I need one myself so. <laughs> <laughs> ultimately music has to move you I mean I can listen to someone playing yes. very technical probably for about 60 seconds and then I sort of switch off but if I listen to someone that is bringing real emotion to a piece of music i have say middle movement the Ebeck concerto for example if I'm listening to that I'm tra- and it's a beautiful play and I can hear the very I can hear the story that's being sold so oh, yeah. I use that word I'm so I'm transcended into a different because it's emotion I sort of don't exactly. get, I don't get turned on by anyone play. I get impressed for a little while someone playing fast but ultimately it's about unlocking the emotion which is what musicians do 
Right. And if you can exactly. and if you can find a way to unlock that emotion that is authentic to you and your values, that is what makes you different from another musician because we all have different values and we all have different emotions and the way we portray these emotions. And if you're trying to be your own manager, which you've really eloquently put down here, if you're able to portray your emotions in written form but also in musical form, you have a head start, don't you? Exactly. Yeah, you can find the ebook on my website, which is morganpappasnyc.com. Um, you can also check out my consulting services there. I offer one on one sessions for anything career related. Um, and that could be as simple as creating an electronic press kit, which is discussed in the ebook, and as well as helping musicians obtain O1B visas if they're from abroad, going over the necessary steps. But yeah, you can find the ebook there. I'm also on Instagram at Morgan period Pappas. Again, it's kind of a personal account, but I'm always posting music related stuff there. And I'm on Facebook at Morgan Pappas. And when it comes to social media, Morgan's underplaying how she understands the processes of Instagram and social media because yes, her, her own account may have gone more sort of ethereal and more sort of seeing Morgan in sort of in beautiful places, walking down beaches and surfing and everything. But Morgan's also been responsible for some taking certain accounts up to very large following. And with with their large following comes engagement because there's two different things there. You can have so many followers, but unless you've got engagement, that's a waste of time. So again, as services that Morgan does offer, which is assistance to growing your social media, whether you're a business or a high profile musician. Correct. So what's yes. the coming year going to be doing with you, Morgan? Because you're going to stay in Costa Rica. For a bit. Yeah, I'll be here for the rest of winter. And then I'll be in New York for a bit and then over to Europe, probably a bit in the summer. Professionally, I'm, you know, working on this agency. It's somewhat new, but it's very exciting. We have a small roster of musicians that I'm the lead agent for. So it's been really fun to promote them and get them contracts with performing arts centers. And in addition to that, yeah, a lot of meditation and <laughs> inner work because I'm really passionate about that as well. And I think I'd like to see my professional life and my inner world kind of collide and We'll see where that takes me. You can hear the, the birds and the monkeys right now. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear I could that. Hear, I could hear the birds earlier, but now I can hear the monkeys, yeah. So. <laughs> Morgan, thank you so much for your time today. I know we, we're speaking from a long way away. Thank okay. you so much for your time. And guys, check this out, How to Be Your Own Agent ebook, because I read a lot of ebooks. I read a lot of wordage I love books. I can't read fiction for some reason, so for me it's all non-fiction. But this goes straight to the point. There is, as I said, there's no fluff. Every word written here has been carefully placed to actually give you assistance. And let's face it, we all need assistance in life. We all need, that's why we have teachers. This book condenses it. And you've just used your experience with artists and with your own working knowledge to put it down. 30 pages, that is all, and it will transform you. So, Morgan, thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Sean Paul, for having me. Pleasure to uh, speak with you. Oh, and yeah, let's, uh, if you're over in Europe with Daniela, let's, let's meet up for an English afternoon tea in London. Yes, <laughs> be a lot of fun, for yeah. sure. So thank you all for listening to Talking Flutes Extra this week. I think I might be up again next week with a Talking Flutes Bite Size. So until then, wishing you all a wonderful week ahead and may your high B be in tune. Because mine never is. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, all. <laughs>
www.thepodcastnetwork.com.